today's microwave repair video, we will be covering the following topics. Basics. Understanding the schematic. Solid state touch boards. Components and functions. Safety precautions. Troubleshooting. General information and where to get parts. The microwave oven. Over 70 million households in America have them. Yet not many appliance servicemen know how to fix them. After watching this tape, you'll have a solid foundation of knowledge on how to confidently repair microwave ovens. Whoa! Let's get to work! The main component in a microwave is the magnetron tube, or for short, the mag tube shown here. From the moment the microwave is turned on, the high voltage transformer is energized, which in turn energizes the mag tube. The mag tube produces the microwave energy required to heat your food. As the microwave energy travels down the waveguide, the microwaves are distributed evenly into the cavity by the stirrer located here. When the microwave is on, the stirrer is always moving. This is a basic microwave schematic. This is just the 110 volt side of the schematic. Later I'll show you the high voltage. Over here we have line one. Over here we have the neutral side. Power travels down through a series of door switches and contacts and reaches the power transformer. This is the main part of diagnosing a microwave. You must have power to the primary windings of the high voltage transformer before the magnetron tube will power up. So when all the switches are closed, you'll get your hot line here, and your neutral line will come through here. This is the same microwave schematic, only showing the high voltage side. So everything below this arrow is high voltage, and everything above is where we talked about before with the 110 hotline coming into the primary windings of the high voltage transformer. Once the high voltage primary windings are energized with 110, neutral being here and the line one hotline being here, this will power up the high voltage windings. When the high voltage windings are energized, this will produce over 4,000 volts. The when the capacitor is working correctly and the diode is working correctly and the filament transformer windings are heating up the mag, mag tube before it fires up, the mag tube will get the desired volts and you will have microwave cooking. So right here is the most critical spot for diagnosing a microwave. You go right here first. If you do have power here, and you don't have any heat, we know that something is wrong in the high voltage part of the microwave. Now if you don't get power to the primary windings of the filament transformer, or excuse me, the primary windings of the transformer shown here and here, then there's no use of even worrying about anything to do with the high voltage side of this schematic because you've got to have the 110 coming to the primaries. Let's go to the 110 side. Let's try to get an understanding of each function on the low voltage 
section of the schematic. Okay, our line one first enters here at the fuse. Most microwaves have 15 amp fuses. When you have a micro microwave that is totally dead, this would be a, the first place to look, to put your own meter from here to here. Okay, let's go to the light switch. When the door is open, this contact is closed, which will cause the cavity light to come on. When the door is closed, you will have contact between this point and this point, providing these switches are closed, the blower should come on, and the light will be open. This is the primary door switch. It's one of three or four, sometimes five door switches on microwaves. This is one, this is the secondary, and this is the monitor switch. So if the door is closed and it is striking the switch and the switch is working correctly, this will be closed. Same with this one. Now the third switch shown here in the schematic is a monitor switch. Every microwave's got one. You'll notice that it goes directly from line one to line two, neutral side, with no load in between. So if this switch fails, it is normally open when the door is closed. So when the door is closed and everything's running, this is open. But when this switch fails, what will it do? Cause a direct short because you're going from line one to line two and blow the fuse out. Let's go to the timer contacts. When you turn the timer on, this simply just closes this switch. got direct power to the timer motor once the timer contacts are closed so the timer motor will come on along with the blower motor when it's running the cook light will come on so all three of these things will come on as soon as the timer contacts make contact and the door switches here where this one makes contact let's go to the solid-state Veracook controller This particular device is what defrosts on your microwave. It allows power to intermittently come on and off. If this is set to say 50% power or just defrost, the solid state device here will tell a switch to open and close. What that does is it'll close for 50% of the time, open, and I'm just talking maybe a, a few seconds in between, like on, off, on, off. And what that does, if all this here is coming through, the power is getting through all these switches and timer contacts, all it's got to do is go through here before it hits the power transformer. So when this is on defrost, you're getting power on, off, on, off. And that just does the same thing to the high voltage transformer. So when the solid state Veracook controller is on defrost and you're getting intermittent power to the primary windings of the transformer, this is getting intermittent, intermittent power. Therefore, the mag tube here is going on and off at the same rate this is shut, shutting on and off. Now, if this was set to low heat or in some cases you've got a one to 10 scale if this is set to uh, power level 10 or whatever, one, one of 10, that means 10% of the time it will be on. So it'll be like on, off, on, off. So it's just 10% of the time. If it's set on three, it's going to be on 30% of the time. And every time that this contact is closed, ultimately the mag tube gets the power. Let's look at the filament transformer here. Again, we have our primary windings of the filament transformer and the filament sides. When this is energized with 110, this is a little different than the high voltage transformer. 
we get about three to five volts. So basically it's a step down transformer. What that does is goes directly into the mag tube. And if you notice, here's the neutral lines going straight into this side. And of course, the hot side is going directly into here. So it is wired a little, it's not wired in series with the high voltage transformer here. What this does, the main purpose, is to warm the magnetron tube up before it gets hit, okay, with this high voltage right in here. That's the general overview of understanding the schematic. Later in the tape, we will go over this in greater depth. This microwave we'll be looking at is a little bit different. The only difference is, is that it has a solid state touch board instead of a timer. The board is located right here within the dotted lines. The primary windings here, the filament windings right here, and the high voltage windings which power up the magnetron tube right here. Different brands of microwaves will look a little bit different, but don't be intimidated. Most of the parts look just the same and the theory is the same. They just might be in different locations. Solid state boards run on approximately 24 volts AC. To get that low voltage, you need a step down transformer. It's shown right here. Most step-down transformers like this one are located on the board itself. Here are your primary windings of the step-down transformer. This receives 110 volts. It energizes these windings down to approximately 24 volts. The board then energizes the triac to close. The triac acts just as a timer switch does on a microwave with a timer. This closes the circuit, feeds juice to the primary windings of the transformer, and you're microwaving. If you understood section two you'll have no problem incorporating the solid state board into the schematic. The solid state board acts as a timer and a variable cook regulator. Some also have extra clock functions and programmable time functions. It's easy. Instead of having a timer contact, and a very cook switch in the path of the primary windings, you simply have a circuit board that takes the place of the timer contacts and the very cook switch. You instead have a triac in the path of the primary windings. It's just a different obstacle for the voltage to pass. Think of the triac as a relay switch. That always works best for me. The circuit board sends a signal to the triac. Now most triacs, and you'll see later in the video, has three wires, okay, two for the uh, gate voltage and then one that's given the signal. So it's just like pulling down a set of contacts on a relay. That's all a triac is. It gets the signal from the board, this closes, and you get power into the primary windings of the power transformer. This board and triac will also take the place of the Veracook switch. When you need to put it on defrost, you need 50% power. Well, this will send the signal just as the Veracook switch did.
Now some models may have a relay switch in the path of the primary windings. I don't have it shown here, but it would be somewhere in the path of this hot side into the primary windings of the transformer. And basically it runs the same way a triac would, and it would be controlled by the circuit board. So some models may have a schematic showing a relay switch. And as long as you understand the properties of that, it's no problem. You got to remember, you've got to have power come all the way down into this side of the primary transformer windings. There's really no known way or efficient way to diagnose a triac other than replacing it with a known to be good triac. Also, when replacing the circuit board, you must put a new triac in with it. The triac could have been the problem why the circuit board went bad. If we're getting 110 line voltage, if it leaks into the board, it's just going to blow your new board out. So it's a must to put a new triac in when replacing the circuit board. Now some triacs are built into the board, so when you order the board and you don't see a triac, or when you order a triac and they don't have one on the list, chances are that it is built into the circuit board. This microwave we'll be looking at is a Sanyu with a solid state circuit board. Let's look at the schematic and identify each part. Now this is the hot side. So this would be line one and this would be neutral. Let's keep that in mind. Hot side and neutral. Right here is the 15 amp fuse to the microwave. This is the mag tube thermal protector. It's a little bimetal, it cuts in and out. This is the surge absorber. This protects against voltage spike. The cavity light. This is the blower motor. Let's go to the door switches. The interlock monitor switch. Another door switch. The secondary interlock switch. This here is the circuit board within these boundaries here. 
it has its own step down transformer right on the board to give it 24 volts. Here's the triac. Here's the keyboard. This is just the touchpad where the numbers are that relays the switching into the board. This is a temp probe jack. This is for when you're cooking meats. You stick the probe into the meat and the, the other end into the probe jack here. And it, the board will compute the temperature and open and close the triac. Now let's go to the high voltage part of the microwave. Right here is the high voltage transformer. These are your primary windings. This is the high voltage windings. It's the filament windings. The next parts we'll look at on the high voltage side is the capacitor here and the diode here. This here is the magnetron tube, or commonly referred to as the mag tube. All microwaves must be properly grounded. A three-prong outlet is good. Provided it is grounded properly, you can check it by putting your leads of your ohmmeter between the ground pin, shown here, the other lead on a copper pipe. Your meter should read infinite for this. Before you start, check the door gasket and the alignment of the door. The dollar bill will work fine for this test. Whenever you work on a door, always check with a radiation tester. The one I have here is old 
and you should probably check with the microwave manufacturer or parts dealer and ask them for a quality microwave leak detector. Turn the microwave on and slide the radiation tester across the seam of the door. If your needle swings into the yellow caution area or the red, realign the door and check again. Before working on the microwave, be sure to unplug before tearing into it. After that, take a screwdriver and short out the capacitor from lead to lead. The capacitor stores juice even after it's unplugged and you can get shocked. If it is properly discharged, you can now begin work. Be aware of where the high voltage system is. Be familiar with the high voltage system parts. There's only four. Number one, we have the transformer. Number two, the diode. Three, the capacitor. And the fourth part, the magnetron tube. The high voltage system is capable of producing over 4,000 volts and could cause serious injury or even death. If the high voltage components look different on the microwave you're working on, be sure to call the manufacturer of the brand of microwave you're working on and find out what the high voltage components look like. Let's go over the right ways of troubleshooting with the power on and the wrong ways of troubleshooting with the power on. Be sure to unplug before working on the microwave. Next step. Discharge the capacitor. Make sure your screwdriver touches both leads. Wiggle it around a little bit. You've got to have contact. Before plugging the machine in to test it live, insert alligator clips made for your meter leads. Clip on the lead and do the same for the other lead. These clips are specially made for your meter leads. Now before turning the machine on, your hands are out of the way and you could stand back and read your meter without your hands getting close to the danger spots. When you're done, turn the machine off and unplug it. And of course, before you go any further, you must discharge the capacitor. Always remember, every time you unplug a microwave, the next step is to discharge the capacitor. Now let's go over it again. After you've unplugged and discharged, you put the meter leads on and your hands are out of the way. Do not leave your hands in. This way you could read the meter away. Now there are other methods of diagnosing microwaves and the ammeter is one. Here I have put the ammeter on the lead and now I'm safely away and I can still read the meter. The important thing here is to keep all hands or any part of your body away from the microwave when the power is on. Let's go over the wrong ways. Okay, here.
here he is unplugging the machine. So far, so good. Bye, ah, didn't dis discharge the capacitor. You must discharge the capacitor after you unplug it. This is very important. Okay, now he's putting his meter leads on and turning the machine on. This is wrong because he's got his hands there. His knuckle could be hitting the high voltage lead. That capacitor has over 4,000 volts. This is wrong too. His hand is in there. You need to clip it on, let go of it, turn the machine on, and watch from a safe distance. The high voltage system again, the high voltage transformer, over 4,000 volts. Do not defeat the operation of the safety switches such that the microwave will work with the door opened. If this is done, you will be in violation of the U.S. Department of Health, Human Services, the Bureau of Radiological Health, and the Federal Communications Commissions. Before putting the wrapping back on, make sure that all the screws and all your tools or anything that's loose inside the microwave is out. If you are unclear of the safety procedures of microwave oven repair, contact a representative from the manufacturer of the microwave you're working on for safety information. Problem? Oven dead. No lights in the board, inside the microwave, no fan. Okay, this is easy. The most common problem lies right here in the fuse. Simply take the unplug the microwave, take the wrapping off, be sure to discharge the capacitor, and ohm the fuse out for resistance. The next thing in line here is the thermal protector which sits on top of the microwave. It's a bimetal cutout. That possibly could be bad. Because you've got to remember, your light's not working and your blower's not working. Your light should always be working because that comes right down in here into a neutral wire. But before you take the wrapping off and check the fuse, check for 110 into your wall socket. Now this isn't always a true test for power. You may have 110 in the wall socket, but the cord may be bad, possibly the neutral. So I advise taking your volt ohmmeter and putting one lead here and one to any side of the neutral. If you get power in your wall but no power from here to here, you have a problem either in your neutral line somewhere or your cord. A good way to test if your ground is good is go from hot to ground. That'll let you know that you are getting a hot side of the power but no neutral. This is an often overlooked problem in diagnosing any appliance. Check your neutral line out. Another way to test this problem is by putting your meter right here. And remember to use the alligator clips with your hands away and you got the microwave running. One right at this point and one somewhere on the neutral side. And if you don't have power, then check it over here, from here to there. Then you know one of these two are bad. Now if you do have power here and you still have nothing, then you just simply go on down. Then you might want to go from this point to neutral and so on to see if you've got if that power has reached that point. 
Very simple problem and very easy to rectify. Problem? Sparks fly inside microwave while cooking. When you get sparks inside your microwave, you usually have a problem with your stir assembly, meaning the stir fan blade that's up underneath the stir cover, meaning the stir won't come around, or you've got a problem with the cover. I always like to look at the cover first. Be sure that you don't have any food particles that have splashed up on the cover and have cooked onto the cover. This alone can cause the microwave to spark. Clean it off first and then test it with a cup of water. If that doesn't work, pull the cover off. Not all of them pull off this easy. This cover is clean. One of the major problems, most common problems, of a microwave that sparks is you might have a hole in here. And what happens is maybe some food got on there and it eventually concentrated on that piece of food and it actually burned a hole through the stir cover. If you have a hole in your stir cover anywhere, I don't care how big or small the stir cover is, this happens to be a large one, you are going to have sparking problems. Okay, that checks out. Up above here we have the stir fan blade. If this blade does not go around while the microwave is cooking, you've got the potential for your microwave to spark inside. Most microwave stirs are driven by either a belt or a motor on top of this. Since this stir does not have a stir motor, either direct driven or by a belt, you could assume that this turns around through the force of the air that comes through the waveguide. That's the same fan blower that cools the magnetron tube. You will have some air that comes through here, catches the fins on the blade, and will slowly turn it. Now you really can't look in there and see if it's, blow if it's turning without the stir cover on there. But you can check to see how easy it goes around. If this bearing on the stir is, is shaking, it's not coming around good, that's a good indication that you need to replace the stir bearing assembly. So, make sure the stir moves freely. Make sure you have no food particles or holes in your stir cover and you have no problems diagnosing a microwave that sparks. Problem? Runs but no heat. This is probably the most common problem. Okay, like I said, this is the most common problem of the most microwaves you hear the fan going, uh, it sounds like it's got all the signs of cooking, but simply no heat. Okay, now, you've already ahead of the game if you know the blower motor is running, okay? So if the blower motor is going, what does that tell us? That we have power all the way up through here. So there's no need to check the fuse, to check the thermal protector, to check this secondary interlock switch, to check this thermal fuse, because we already know that the blower works. Not only that, we know that the common over here is good. If there's any kind of switching on the neutral common side that's going into the blower motor, we know that that's okay. So we're already ahead of the game. Now, I don't know if you remember what I told you at the beginning of the tape, that all of microwave diagnosing is, is going right to the primary windings of the power transformer, or otherwise known as the high voltage transformer. You must have your hot line coming to one end of these windings and your neutral end coming to the other side of the windings. So this is the first place that you go to. Now I want you to check back with the safety procedures on chapter 8 to make sure that you check this right because you do have to run this, check this with the power going. 
I don't want your hands in there while you're checking this out. Okay, with the voltmeter and with this going, I want you to first get your voltmeter, one clip here, one clip here. Again, use alligator clips and then stick one end of each lead right there. Okay, there is another way to do it that uh, may be a little bit quicker, and some might prefer the amprobe meter. And if you just stick your amprobe meter around one of these wires, you should be able to tell if you're getting power to the windings or not. And I'll explain a little bit about that later. But right now, let's just work with the voltmeter. Okay, at this point, you have both your leads of your meter on each end of the primaries. You could go ahead and leave the wires on for this. It's okay. You don't need to pull one wire. Okay, start the microwave up, and again, you've got your alligator clips, so your hands doesn't have to be in here, and you just watch your voltmeter. Now, if you do have power into this, into the primaries, if you do get one tenth, then that means your problem lies in the high voltage. But right now, let's just concentrate on what we would do if we didn't get power here at the windings. And let me repeat that again, because this is so important. If you do have power coming into the primary windings, and in just a little bit here, I'll show you where the primary windings are on the transformer. If you do have power coming here, your problem is down below here in the high voltage part. And there's only four parts in your high voltage system, so uh, from there on out, it's real easy, and we'll go over that. But uh, right now, let's look at where the... the uh, primary windings are on the microwave. Okay, this is the power transformer or high voltage transformer and this particular microwave has the filament windings built into it. You could tell that because it's got five wires. One, two, three, four, and five. If this transformer had a separate filament transformer you would only have three wires and that would be your two primaries and one high voltage. Now let's go over these wires real quick. These two are your primaries and I'll show you how I know that in a little bit. Okay, this is a primary, this is a primary. So this is your primary windings. You've got two wires going to the primary windings. Okay, this here is the high voltage. It, your high voltage will always go to one side of the capacitor. It's the only wire that is by itself on the capacitor on one side. On this other side we've got like three wires, okay? Your filament transformer wires, which is here and here, will go directly to the mag tube. This wire is going up to the mag tube. This wire goes to the other side of the capacitor and then on that same leg will go up to the mag tube. This is very common. They're all basically the same on the high voltage. So we got our primaries here. Let's do our filament windings. They both go to the mag tube. There's one, two. That goes to the mag tube because it does go directly. And the high voltage will always go to the opposite side by itself on the capacitor. So the way to tell what is the primaries and that's where we, this is very important because you don't want to be putting your meter on this leg right here and you're getting 4,000 volts and blowing your meter up. So the easy way to tell is to identify the filaments in the high voltage wires first. And then the last two have got to be your primaries. Also the wires here are a little bit thinner. That's another giveaway. But I want you to go through both. I want you to identify before you put any kind of leads on your, your voltmeter, on any wires, I want you to know where every wire, what every wire does. Okay, so to find your primaries, because they don't all look like that, you might have wires coming in from behind. So you must identify the filaments first, and the filaments are the only two that come out of the transformer, and you don't know where they're going to come out. They go, one goes, one side goes directly into the mag tube, one goes into one side of the capacitor first, and then out that same side, up to the uh, other side of the mag tube, then the high voltage wire, which also this one does have a tag on it saying warning high voltage, but not all of them have that. But this one high voltage goes in to the lone side. So
So once we figure out what these wires are, the only two left are the primaries. Very simple. Okay, let's make it even easier. We've got five wires coming out of the transformer. One, two, three, four, five. Before we can check power to the primaries, we've got to know where we're putting it. So we must identify each wire. So start with the high voltage. This is the only one that's by itself on the capacitor on one side. Okay, that was easy. The filaments. One goes directly to the mag tube. The other one goes directly to the mag tube. But it stops off at the other side of the capacitor. third wire here coming from this side of the capacitor goes to the diode. Now that we've identified one, two, and three wires, there's only two left, and that just leaves the primaries. These wires are normally smaller than the other three, but you must not go by that. You must identify all five wires on the transformer first before you check the windings on the power transformer. Easy enough. Okay, let's say we did check power on the primary windings and we get no power. But the complaint is it runs but no heat. Well, what they're here and running is this blower motor. And remember, this is line one and this is neutral. So if that blower's working, I know for sure I've got power to this point. And from here to here, there's no switches. But just to make sure that this wire is, is good, let's put one lead here, and let's put one lead right here, or right here. We want to get it before there's any switches to make sure that we're getting a good neutral. So if we get 110 from here, one lead here, one lead here, and we got 110, well, that means I know I've got power. That means I could just forget about this whole side. I could forget about this switch. I could forget about this thermal protector, this thermal protector, and, of course, the fuse because I know the blower is working. I've got power here. I do have a neutral wire, okay? Now, notice we do have some switches here on the neutral side. We have our primary interlock door switch. This could be the culprit. Another culprit could be the triac. Now we're assuming that the board is lighting up and counting down. If that's the case, we know we've got power into the step-down transformer down here, and the board is counting down. But now we've got to find out if this triac is closing. This board, since we know we've got power into the board, should be telling this contact to close here, this triac to close. So let's check to see what the problem is. So if we put our lead from here, where we know we've got definite hot power to write, say, right in here or here, and we get 110, that means this switch is good. Now, if we don't get 110, that says that switch is bad because it's the only thing left because we knew we had power from here to this point, but no juice from here to here. So that says our switch is bad. Now, if we do get power here, let's m try it from here to here. Now, definitely we should not be getting power because when we f originally put our leads here, we're getting zero. So let's just say that we do have one lead here and one lead here, and we're getting no power. Well, it's obvious what the problem is. It'd be the triac. And what we always do is jump it out. But don't just jump it out without pulling the wire that goes to the board off because there's a good chance that this could be f this switch could be fused and you'd be letting 110 into the board, then you've really got a problem. So pull the wire off the triac, take a jumper wire, jump it. Now you should be getting power through here. Now I shouldn't say power, but your neutral should be coming through. And you must have both sides complete. The circuit must be complete on the neutral end and the hot end. And a lot of microwaves 
you will find switches on the neutral end, which is really uncommon in dishwashers, refrigerators, any other kind of appliances that you see. So th you must be aware that you've got to be feet. You got to take these lines separately and check them out separately. Now, if our blower didn't work and we didn't get heat and everything else seemed to be working, you had your light on and the board was counting down, well, then I would be suspecting that we didn't get any power on this end. But you could still not have a neutral. So you've got to go through the same process. Take your meter, pick a spot, you know, pick right here, go to a, a good known to be neutral and start checking, start power. And if you get power from this point to this point, you know the fuse and this therm thermal protector is good. If you don't get it from here to here, well, we know that this switch is bad because it's the only thing between here and here. Very simple. Before we go on to diagnosing the high voltage part of the microwave down below here, I would like to go over a another way that I mentioned earlier to test power to the primary windings. Of course, one that I mentioned first here, what we talked about is putting a lead here and here first to see if we've got power to separate the system to see whether the problem's in the low voltage or down to the high voltage. The way I like to do it, and it's much easier and less time consuming, is putting an amprobe meter on either one side of the windings or the other. It doesn't matter. Now, if you've got your amprobe meter, let's say around this wire here, you turn the machine on, you got the blower and everything, and your amp probe says three amps, right around there. At full draw, when everything's working, you'll have anywhere from from nine or eight to uh, 13 amps, depending on the wattage of your microwave. If you only get three amps right here, you know that we're getting power to the, pr to the primaries and your problem's in the high voltage side. Now, if you clip your amp probe, meter on this wire again and you get zero that means you've got no power here so it's the same as putting your volt meter on the on each side of these windings so you know you've got power to these windings if it says if you're drawing a little bit let's say three amps or so and if you're getting zero that means you're not getting any power here let me show you what I mean using my volt meter I have my leads hooked up to the primaries windings of the transformer. Let's turn it on and see what we get. And you can see the needle swing up which means I'm getting about 110 volts, just what I should be. So here I know everything on my low voltage is okay and the problem lies in the high voltage windings. Now let's try using the amp probe doing the same thing. Okay, after unplugging the machine and discharging the capacitor I've got my amp probe meter on. Let's turn it on to see what we get. Okay, the needle did swing up. So that's an indication that we do have power to those windings. I'm not real concerned how far that needle swings as long as it goes up. If it wouldn't have moved at all, I would have known that I had no power at the primary side of the transformer. Okay, now we're gonna learn how to diagnose the high voltage side of the microwave. Assuming that we have no power on the primary windings of the transformer, let's diagnose the high voltage side. First, let's review our parts. There's only four parts on the high voltage system. Here's the transformer. The capacitor. This little black thing right here is the diode. And up here we have the magnetron tube. Okay, so assuming we have no power to the primary windings, let's start to diagnose. That's right, we had to flash the warning signal here. There's four, over 4,000 volts that this high voltage system omits. This is not something we fool around with. That's why all the diagnosing is done with the power off. 
with exception to the filament transformer windings, but even that could be ohmed out. So what I like to do is just unplug the machine and then diagnose. Remember, do not diagnose anything on this microwave with the power on on the high voltage side. So when you're checking the high voltage side, always, always unplug the machine first. After we unplug it, always discharge the capacitor. Okay, the way we diagnose this is by process of elimination. Since we know we only have four components on this high voltage side, the transformer, the capacitor, the diode, and the mag tube, we'll just start at one, uh, let's say the most common problem. The diode seems to be the most common component to fail on the high side, so we'll start with that. And we're just going to ohm each one of these out and check them out individually. Now I want to start off by saying that you cannot use a little meter like this, although this works good for a lot of applications, uh, diagnosing appliances, this will not work for microwaves. The reason being, it's only got an a size battery in it. You will need, however, a meter that's at least as good as this one shown right here. The reason why this one is sufficient is that it carries a 9 volt battery. When we're trying to ohm out components with the resistance that the diode has, we've got to have a meter that's strong enough to read it. Okay, now let's test the diode, which is right here. We'll pull the wire off here. Now the diode is also referred to as a rectifier. So some people may call them a rectifier, but they're more, more commonly known as a diode. What we'll do is we'll stick one end of the meter here and one to ground because the bottom part of this is grounded. Now your meter should either be open or closed, one or the other. Now reverse them. Okay, let's do it again with the meter in view. I've got the red lead on top, black on bottom. As you look at my ohm meter, this is open. I'll put the red on the bottom and the black on the top, and I should read something, and I do. This is an indication that the diode is good. If I was to read continuity this way and this way, the diode would be bad. Or if it was open both ways, it would be bad. But if one way that you go, you get continuity like we get here, and the other is open, the diode is good. Okay, now let's check out the capacitor. I have one lead of my ohm meter on the back side of the capacitor terminal. I will put the other lead of the ohm meter on the front side of the capacitor terminal. When I touch it, watch the needle on the ohm meter. It should swing up and then down. It might just go a little ways, but it'll go up and down. Now watch, here I, here I go. Okay, that's a good sign. Now I'll reverse the leads. And the same thing should happen. That's the sign that the capacitor is good. If it does not swing up and down, you have a bad capacitor. Now let's look at the third high voltage part. What I'm going to do is basically ohm out the windings. Let's start with the primary windings. Pull the wire. I should get a reading here, and I do. Now some schematics will show what resistance the ohms reading that you should have. This schematic doesn't on this microwave. So basically what I'm looking for is just some continuity. The primary windings should not be grounded. So that's open. Windings are closed. That checks out. Now let's go to the filament windings. 
which remember is this one here and also this one coming out into the capacitor. We'll pull one wire there and check it and the other one where it comes into the capacitor. I do have resistance. The filament windings should not be grounded. Now we are getting a ground right here because of the capacitor. So this wire would have to be pulled out. Okay, now I have both wires of the filament windings off. Let's check it again. One to one side, the other to the other. You get a reading. Now this should not be grounded, and it is not. Now that we've pulled the wire off the capacitor. So to ground, it's open. If you get a closed reading here, the transformer is bad. Now the high voltage, there's only one wire coming off the high voltage. Now this should be grounded. This is the only winding that goes to ground. If it's open, you have a bad transformer. Let's take a look at this procedure on the schematic. Right here is the transformer. We'll go through and do the same thing we did on the real microwave. We check the primary windings for continuity. Notice how it's not grounded anywhere. We should have continuity. This should not be open. The filament windings. There's continuity at the filament windings. In the high voltage windings, there's only one lead on the high voltage windings, and it goes to ground. That's why when we check that, we go to ground. Okay, now that leaves us with the magnetron tube. This is the most difficult to diagnose correctly. Normally, if the transformer the capacitor and the diode check out and you do have problems in the high voltage system you need to change the mag tube out there is a couple checks that you can ohm out but there is no for sure way of diagnosing it first of all you could put a lead here and here and it should be closed you should have some continuity here if it's open replace the mag tube this isn't very likely the next thing you could do is go from here to ground somewhere on the casing and it should be open. Now even though this is shows a ground here, this is internally. This is not anything to do with the tube itself. This is not grounded. So if you do have a mag tube that's grounded, then you can correctly diagnose the mag tube. Now the only other way you could do it is put some kind of a voltmeter here that can read 4,000 volts and, and upwards of 4,000 volts. Uh, I don't know of any meter right now to date that does that. If you do, call me and let me know. I'd like to find out because that would be a, a sufficient way to diagnose the mag tube. But from here to here you should have continuity and you should have no ground from here to there. Okay, let's pull the leads away from the mag tube. Now the reason you can't just flat out ohm this to diagnose a good or bad magnetron tube it's because the resistance is so low now if I were to take my leads and short them out I would get the same reading as the mag was reading Now if you do own this out and it's open, then by all means change the mag tube out. Or if you put a lead here and one to ground and it's shorted, then replace the mag tube. Okay, let's recap the high voltage system. First, unplug. You should be able to diagnose everything 
without any power. Next, make sure to get a screwdriver in between these two leads of the capacitor to short it out. Discharge the capacitor. Next, it's just a process of elimination. We check one at a time. The diode, put one lead here, say a red lead here, black lead here, you should have a reading. Switch it around, black, red, should be open. In other words, the electricity just goes, flows in one direction, which is down towards ground. The capacitor is next. If that's good, you go to the capacitor. One lead here, one lead here. The needle swings up of your own meter and back down. Reverse leads, it'll swing up and back down again. Over to the transformer, it's just a matter of putting an ohm meter from each side of the primary windings, ohming it out. You should have resistance. It should not go to ground. Same with the filaments. They're the same as the primaries. You should have resistance with the windings, no resistance to ground. High voltage windings are different. There's only one lead here, and that goes to ground. Some transformers, you will see an extra lead there with no wire. And what that is, is to boost the power up. If you are getting a complaint of not enough heat, this would be the first thing I would do, is take this lead off and boost it up. If all three of these components check out, and you do have problems in the high voltage system, which means you are getting power to the primary windings, and all three here check out, your mag tube is bad. Although I would ohm this out to make sure that the tube itself isn't open and to make sure that you do not have a short to ground. Problem? Microwave blows fuses. The most common problem for blown fuses is overloaded circuits. And by that I mean if your refrigerator and microwave are plugged into the same outlet and maybe the breaker is not tripping soon enough, well, more than likely the microwave fuse will go out. You've got to remember you've only got a 15 amp fuse in there. And when the mi magnetron tube is fired up, you're going to get upwards to 12, 13 amps. The next reason a fuse would blow, I would suspect a monitor switch. That is right here. And this is the switch that we talked about earlier. It goes directly from the hot side all the way to the neutral line right here. So it's just a direct shot. Now, if this isn't making contact, if the door striker does not hit this switch, well, it remains closed. This is a normally closed switch, as you see here. When the door is closed, it opens up. So it opens the circuit up. So if this switch is not activated, it will remain closed, and you have a direct short from line one, hot line, to neutral. Now, other things that could cause a microwave to blow fuses is maybe something in the high voltage. Um, Maybe you have a bad capacitor or a transformer. A lot of times you could see smoke coming out of it or you can you could smell a part. Um, sometimes if it, you plug it in and it just blows right away or it's burning something that you can't see, if it's burning something you can't see, I would advise to put a piece of copper in here. And this is what they call a smoke test. If you do this by putting a copper tube in there, I would be very close to the plug so you could jerk it out quickly if it starts to smoke too bad. But once the part starts to smoke, definitely unplug it. And the one the part that smokes is definitely the culprit and that's why it's blowing the fuse. Other things that might cause the fuse to blow is possibly a cavity light or a blower motor or any kind of part. Uh, any kind of part that could ground out. Let's say the cavity light internally was grounded or the blower motor. And this is something that you're just going to have to ohm out separately after pulling both of the leads off. I would like to make one final note.
concerning putting the copper tube for a smoke test. Exercise extreme caution when doing this. If you do not feel comfortable doing this, call your manufacturer or call me. I'd be glad to give you some advice. But the bottom line is, if you don't feel confident and comfortable doing this, don't do it. Problem? Board is lit, but not responding to command. If your board is lit, but does not respond to commands, you could have problems with your keyboard or touchpad, whatever you want to call it. This is separate from the circuit board. This is just a, a switching device. If you can get your own meter leads into these wires, you should be able to read open or close when you depress one of the numbers. If your board will not light up, I would check for power into your step-down transformer. This is your hotline. This goes directly into neutral. So you should have 110 into here. If you do, come to the other side of your windings. You should have at, at least 24 volts or somewhere there's about. If the board counts down and everything runs but it doesn't heat, I would suspect the triac. What you do is pull this wire from the triac that goes from the triac to the board and jump from this point to this point. If it does heat, I would replace the board and the triac. If the board counts down and nothing happens, you don't get a blower or hear anything, I would suspect the board and triac. Now remember, every time you replace the printed circuit board, this must be replaced with it. Bef before replacing a suspected bad board, you might want to try spraying it with a circuit board cleaner. You could pick stuff like this up at Radio Shack. Problem? Heats, but heats poorly. Are you getting full power? Check your voltmeter and make sure that you've got 110 into your microwave. Make sure your primary windings are getting full power. You can do this by putting an ammeter on this wire here. Your board may be confused by sending intermittent power. By putting an ammeter on there and the needle stays steady, you know you're getting a full dose of steady power. You may have a weak capacitor. Put a known to be good capacitor in and do a wattage test to see if it improved. Linton has microwave wattage test kits. Give them a call and order one today. If your transformer is equipped with an extra high voltage lead, I would suggest moving this wire onto this new lead. This will boost the power. Another reason why your microwave n might not heat like it should is that you might have a bent stir blade.
Microwave energy will pass through many materials such as glass, china, paper, and most plastics. Generally, these are great cooking utensils when cooking with microwaves. Other materials such as metal or foil will reflect microwave energy and may cause it to spark inside the cavity. It could also shorten the life of the magnetron tube because of the extensive backfeed of RF energy which raises the temperature of magnetron filament. Because metal reflects microwave energy, the metal walls inside the microwave does not get hot. But since food has a high moisture content, the microwave energy is absorbed into the foods.